want to welcome everybody today to the uh, Division 46 Media Psychology webinar series. And we're really fortunate today to have with us Jessica Williams and Lauren Burke. And also um, the, with the influence of Fran Blumberg, she was all, she's not able to present today, but she was instrumental in the study. So the title of today's presentation is what do we know about media literacy and why do we care? It's going to be about the focus of media literacy, including what we currently know about media literacy and why that's important. The presenters will discuss the current landscape of media literacy education in the United States and potential uh, pitfalls and improvements uh, to education efforts in this area. Finally, uh, they'll talk about the implications for media literacy intervention and they will include ideas about designing uh, your own intervention. First off, we have Jessica Williams. She's a senior research and evaluation associate at AME. Her research examines children learning through media, specifically the development of advertising literacy. She also works in children's media, conducting formative research for children's preschool television shows and related products. Lauren Burke is a doctoral student at Fordham University, whose research examines the impact of new media technologies on adolescent girls' self-esteem and body image. She formerly was the admissions manager at Renfrew Center of New York and an outpatient, an outpatient clinic dedicated to treating eating disorders. And many of you probably know Fran Blumberg from our division. She's been very active in sort of active roles. She's an associate professor at Fordham University Graduate School of Education. And she's a developmental psychologist whose research examines children learning in formal and informal settings. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Jessica and Lauren, and looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for doing this for us today. Thank you, of course. Thank you so much for having us today. We're excited to talk about this. Okay, so you know, we'll start out with what is media literacy? Um, a definition that's often given is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and create messages across a variety of contexts. Um, more recent conceptualizations of media literacy emphasize five interrelated competencies. Um, the first is access, which encompasses listening skills and reading comprehension, um, as well as keyboard, mouse, and interface skills. Um, it's basically understanding the medium you're working in and how to use it. Um, the second is analysis, which is the ability to identify the author, source, and purpose of the media message. Um, this involves critical reading of media messages, evaluation, and being able to understand and res resist stereotypes and biases. The third is create and collaborate. Um, this is the ability to brainstorm and generate ideas and to create messages across various platforms and contexts um, with others and alone. And the fourth is reflect. So this is the ability to consider the potential risks, harms, and benefits of media messages to understand how differences in people's cultures can shape how they view media. Um, and the final competency is taking action. So this is the ability to use these media literacy skills to make an impact or difference in the world. So now that we know what media literacy is, why should we care about it? So to take a, let's take kind of a step back and you know, when we say why should we care about media literacy and really let's focus first on the amount of media consumption that's happening these days. So um, this generation, you know, adolescents, um, and a little bit younger has been named the media multitasking generation because of the ability to use different forms of media on one device. So taking your iPad or your iPhone, for example, um, and being able to play a game and access the internet and text message all at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really looking at the prevalence of media consumption and use by children and adolescents, particularly these days we're looking at the internet and smartphones. Um, so a common sense media research study in 2013 found that 75% of all children ages zero to eight, so zero to eight years old, we're not talking about this kind of adolescent age range, we're talking about children mm -hmm. um, in the US have access to a smart device of some kind. So an iPad or a smartphone. Um, I know my nephew is five and 
the ability he has to work on the iPad and use it is more advanced even, you know, than I've seen some adolescents and adults. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something that they're picking up quickly at a young age and learning to use. Um, a Pew Research Center study in 2013 also found that by examining teenage, uh, teenagers' media use patterns, they found that 37% of teens have their own smartphone, 23% had their own tablet, and 93% had access to a computer at home. Um, I would hedge a bet that since that study in 2013, that the 37% of teens with their own smartphone, I would guarantee has increased um, mm -hmm. since 2013. Mm -hmm. They also found that further 92% of teenagers report daily media use with 56% reporting that they go online several times a day and 24% saying that they are online almost constantly. And that kind of refers back to, again, the media multitasking. So being on their phone and checking Facebook, Instagram, playing Candy Crush, text messaging, mm -hmm. again, the amount that they're able to do that is really, um, it's, it's amazing in a lot of ways, but it's also scary in some. So why is media literacy important then? So media literacy represents a promising prevention approach to decrease uh, media internalization. So being able to really help educate against some of those negative messages that happen in the media, um, reduce the risk for the development of eating disorders, depression, um, and through the use of learning activities that build skills to kind of this social persuasion. So. Um, for example, we all know with something like Instagram where you're really filtering a lot of what you're putting on there, having someone understand that, you know, this is someone's life through a filter and they might have taken 50 shots to get this one specific shot, helping really educate them can help reduce the risk of, you know, let's say people feeling bad about themselves, you know, depression or anxiety or, you know, body image issues. Uh, media literacy also helps empower children, adolescents, and adults to adopt a critical evaluation of the media content, as I was saying before, so really to analyze and challenge and propose alternative cultural ideas presented in mass media. So, what should we know about media literacy? Um, so really, the research here falls into two categories um, on media literacy. So you have the protectionist uh, research, which really focuses on the potential danger around media usage. So looking at um, how there's advertising susceptibility, um, how the media can portray stereotypes, um, unhealthy body image, um, and really for people being exposed to media content that is not developmentally appropriate. Um, so one of the things that we find a lot in the research now is that with the constant access to internet, that children and adolescents, if they're not having those kind of um, filters put on them by their parents, mm -hmm. they can really access anything. And so they're really being exposed to, um, you know, different editorial content, different pictures that they might not be ready to have their brains kind of process and they might not really understand because no one's actually sitting there and teaching them about it. Um, there's also a ton of benefits to media, especially the new media technologies like the internet. And so there's this field of research that talks about the empowerment, so the benefits of media usage. So really looking at you know, how you can be a global citizen. Um, media can be used for entertainment, for information, um, and identity development. And that's a really big focus of, of my personal research is looking at how um, you know, teens and young adolescents can really use the media to find people that feel more like them. Um, versus, you know, maybe 20 years ago, they might feel ashamed of who they were because they weren't seeing people um, or messages in the media that really looked like them. But, you know, nowadays with access to the internet, they're really able to not only find people that resemble them, but also play around with different types of identity until they find one that, that feels more like them. Mm -hmm. So what does media literacy education look like? Um, so to kind of break it down, it's a module or single lesson replacing lessons in a given subject area, mm -hmm. um, a project within a given subject area, or an internal, uh, sorry, an integral part of curriculum in a given subject area. Um, it can be an intervention focused on narrowly defined aspects of media literacy, such as how to read advertisements, uh, 
or financial literacy, um, and programs that help inform the audience about potentially harmful effects of the media and in turn bring greater awareness to media related benefits and attitudes. Um, so what we found is, and this is a part of the research as well, a lot of the media literacy research um, has actually started over in um, Europe. We find that there's a big push in that area. The US is a little slow to catching up. Mm -hmm. uh, so we fall way behind in Europe in terms of Im implementing media literacy curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that, you know, and we are getting there, but you'll find that, for example, you know, England bans Photoshop on all makeup and uh, makeup advertisements. You can't Photoshop at all, whereas we are not kind of at that place. And it's because of really this media literacy education that, that's really put these stops in place. Um, currently, very few states have a mandated media literacy curriculum. So for example, in Texas, in 10th grade, so your sophomore year of high school, students are required to create a short documentary about a community social issue. Um, and Texas students must pass a test prior to graduating high school that includes a section about persuasion and advertising. But you know, here in the New York, New Jersey area, we're finding that it's maybe being put more into kind of the health classes mm -hmm. and maybe some of the psychology classes, mm -hmm. but we're not really seeing necessarily um, you know, as much of a kind of state mandate um, mm -hmm. as other states have. Mm -hmm. So what are the impediments to the US media uh, literacy education? Um, so there has in the past been some, you know, Hobbes found some teacher ambivalence about the role of media and technology in the classroom. Um, also, some concern that media literacy education will kind of distract from the instruction in more traditional areas of study. Um, there's been parental focus on other forms of literacy, such as reading and writing versus media literacy at home. Uh, media literacy at home really does require a lot of the parent to kind of be sitting there with the you know child with the adolescent and really be engaging in the media with them as well as teaching them you know dissecting it and going through it so the parent themselves almost you know needs to have this media literacy training in order to train you know their child or their adolescent exactly. there's also a lack of research examining the efficacy of media literacy efforts among students of different ages um, so how can U.S. media literacy education be improved? Um, so one of the ways is make apparent the relevance of media literacy to students' lives, um, provide professional development for teachers, um, as well as parents on the relevancy of media literacy to their instruction, um, advocate, as I was saying before, greater involvement of parents in the media uh, literacy education, uh, conduct more research investigating the efficacy of media literacy efforts, as well as more funding for the research uh, investigating mm -hmm. this, um, and develop a set of competencies that can be used to guide curriculum and research. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're going to delve a little bit deeper into uh, media literacy interventions. And, you know, based on the research available, what should these interventions look like? Um, so we're going to start with interventions in the classroom. Um, researchers and practitioners, according to the research, should make sure that these interventions are developmentally appropriate. Um, children and adolescents have different levels of media literacy and that their understanding and relationship with media changes throughout their development. Um, so it's important when designing, designing a media literacy intervention um, that you're considering the developmental stage of your audience. Um, to ensure that the intervention is accessible and appropriate for them to make it as effective as possible. Um, media literacy interventions should also involve active involvement components. Um, so research has shown that interventions with active audience involvement, whether it's from a lively discussion or having um, participants create or produce different types of media messages or partake in different types of active activities, um, this may be more effective than just having an intervention with passive involvement. So just teaching a lesson or providing a lecture. Um, interventions may also be more effective when they explore specific topics. Um, they focus on one specific element related to media literacy, such as stereotypes, advertising, um, societal pressures and underlying biases, um, and consumer activism. 
So next we're gonna look at some therapeutic interventions. So this, when I was working uh, as an eating disorders therapist was a really important part of um, not only our therapy, but education for both the um, patient as well as the family. So we did a lot of this in our therapy sessions when, you know, yes, we would have some patients come in that would really be more affected by media than others, but it just, the importance was there all around because, you know, you can't run away from media. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't run away from, I mean, unless I guess you're in a cabin in the woods somewhere with no <laughs> access to internet or anything, you really uh, can't avoid it. So it's how can we help you um, feel more comfortable around it? How can we help you um, be more educated about the messages they're trying to give you? Um, and how can we help you uh, feel more confident in your use of media? Mm -hmm. So with the ther therapeutic interventions, one of the main things we worked on was stereotypes. So we are not all the same. So defining stereotypes. So for women, you know, one of the stereotypes that you've seen a lot in the media, and I think we're getting a little bit better with this, you know, there are no body shame, cam shame campaigns and things of that nature. Um, but looking at stereotypically, you know, who's on the magazine covers, um, examine magazines for advertisements that stereotype women, men, and these lifestyles. So, you know, you have to be thin and rich, you know, to be happy um, is a, is a stereotype with women that we would see a lot um, that our patients would be affected by. Um, does this advertising affect how we think about men and women? So when you see, you know, this model that's thin and rich, like, do you think that that's what you need in order to be happy? Um, and are there famous individuals who do not fit this stereotype? So really looking at really positive role models in the media. Um, for men and women that you can say like this person comes off in the media as happy and they don't have X Y and Z that you think you need to be this way um, So looking also at media advertising. So this is really breaking down kind of the content of, of The media. So what tactics do they use? So why my advertisers want to want us to be unhappy with the way they look? obviously to sell more products. So if you feel unhappy about the way that you look, you know, and you're being told that you need this skincare to erase wrinkles, oh yeah, well, maybe I need that. I don't have that. And that will then get you to purchase the product. So really kind of educating on that. Um, is it worth our efforts to attempt to look like a false computer enhanced image that we see in, in the media? And again, this is kind of going back to what I was saying before about England, that they don't, um, really allow kind of the photoshopping in a lot of these advertisements um, because it's not a realistic portrayal. Um, hopefully that's something that we can here in the States really start to get behind at some point. Um, the next topic uh, that we would talk about is pressure. So who places pressure on us and what can we do about it? So examining pressures from the media, family and friends. Um, is it internal pressure? Is it coming from, a you know, being competitive with friends and wanting what they want. Again, looking at it through the Instagram filter, as I like to say. Um, are we feeling pressure from the media? Do our family want us to be a certain way? So really kind of helping examine that and breaking that down. Uh, what can we do to handle when pressure is placed on us? And this is where that really important piece in a therapeutic intervention of coping skills comes in. So when you feel like, you know, you're receiving these media messages and this pressure and you're not feeling good about ourselves, what are some things that we can do? Um, writing positive daily affirmations was one of them. Um, we also had the girls uh, once write a letter campaign um, to help them feel like they have control of what they were saying. We had them write a letter campaign to one of the cosmetic brands that was really heavily photoshopping their advertisements saying, you know, can you please consider not photoshopping your advertisements? These are the reasons why. Um, so feeling like they are the ones in control of the media versus the media being in control of them. Um, what are some ways to handle peer pressure? Again, I, I keep going back to kind of Instagram and Facebook, but it's like this constant photo sharing that is really filtered. You know, how do you deal with kind of seeing that? And how do you deal with, you know, um, getting peer pressure placed on friends to either look a certain way or be a certain way. Um, what qualities do we admire in others? So really working on more of kind of helping them identify the, you know, internal qualities. So 
this is your best friend. Why is this person your best friend? And nine times out of 10, we would have people say back to us, they're caring, they're smart, they're funny. So kind of helping identify for them, like, okay, oh, sorry. Okay. Kind of helping identify for them, like those are the qualities that you see in others. What kind of qualities do you think people would say in you? And helping them really kind of understand that it's, that it's gonna end up being about these internal qualities. Um, role play also is very important. So we would do role play in responding to negative comments. Um, so being in a situation where um, I would either be, you know, a media advertisement, I would pretend I was one, or being a friend or a parent and, you know, saying something negative about the way that they appeared, helping them, helping them kind of respond back to them, uh, to that person and helping them really, again, gain control of the situation so they were the ones that were in power. Um, and what can we do to make sure we don't place too much pressure on others? So really with the negative critiquing and things of that nature, kind of working on finding the positive internal comments about others versus kind of, you know, the negative judgment com comments. Um, so consumer activism is another way. So praising the good and protesting the bad. Mm -hmm. So brain ways, possible ways to engage in activism. And this is kind of what I was talking about before where we would do letter writing campaigns um, to certain brands that they felt like were either um, portraying two skinny models or they felt like were ev heavily editing and Photoshopping. Um, and you'll see that sometimes celebrities will do this as well. Um, there's a young girl woman, her name is uh, Zendaya, and she is popular with adolescents. I think she's an actress and she sings. And she was heavily Photoshopped in a recent uh, magazine shoot that she did. And she actually called out the magazine and placed the non-edited picture online and said to her followers, this is the non-edited version of me. I don't want people to think this is an unrealistic image. So you know, that's obviously on a greater scale, but doing things like that to really kind of call people out and say, why are you doing this? Um, and is advertising harmful? What do you think? So really help raise a general discussion of concept, concepts with them. Um, and commonly identified outcomes include, you know, a decreased focus on appearance, greater knowledge of advertising techniques, and an increased self-awareness. And so to continue with advertising, um, within the field of me media literacy, there's a growing interest in advertising literacy, um, which is often characterized as an individual's ability to analyze, evaluate, and create persuasive messages across media context. Um, advertising literacy interventions are often a one-time brief lesson, similar to what we already discussed about you know, the media literacy education in the United States. These often occur only at one point in time in their brief, you know, within another kind of curriculum or within another um, element within school or in a classroom. Um, and they're often meant to teach children about the persuasive intentions of advertising. Um, the interventions may be trying to develop um, children's knowledge about the persuasive messages and the way they think, which is factual interventions. They're trying to appeal to children's cognitive defenses, or they may be trying to impact the way that children feel about advertising messages and their attitudes. And these are trying to bolster their effective defenses. Um, a study that was done by Buchan found that children's effective responses and their attitudes predicted their attentions to ask the parents to purchase advertised products, um, whereas their cognitive responses only indirectly influenced their behaviors by affecting their attitudes. So this study may point out that um, it may be important in addition to sort of teaching children about advertising persuasive intentions and these tactics to sort of try to shape their attitudes towards advertising. Um, another study that was done by Stern and On found that children who were given an advertising literacy lesson as an intervention were most successful at identifying the sponsor in an advert game, um, which is an online game that's created as a self-marketing technique. However, the authors of the study also found that only 19% of all of their participants were able to identify the sponsor. Um, so this shows that, you know, while intervention groups can be more successful, it may be difficult for children in general to understand these underlying persuasive messages found in advertising specifically 
you know, within stealth marketing techniques such as averaging. So this may be an area where more research and certainly more types of interventions to help children sort of defend themselves or just, to, you know, to be informed consumers are necessary. Um, so here's some of the limitations of the media literacy interventions that's been found. Um, there's very few intervention studies for new types of media. And, you know, as we know, there's new types of media created all the time. There's new social media, there's new content, there's new ways of engaging with media. Um, and the research is not currently sort of keeping up with this and designing interventions meant to deal with all these types of new media. And I think we've talked about this. There's been kind of just this explosion uh, over the past 10 years. You know, we were really focused on you know, magazines and a lot of print media. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, really this explosion with the internet and social media mm -hmm. and virtual social worlds and the advert games. And exactly. we just haven't been able to do the research quick enough to really catch up with everything yep. that's, that's happening. Exactly. Um, so, you know, to our next point, there's a lack of empirical research in general, specifically longitudinal research. Um, often, these studies focus on short-term effects and they aren't looking at sort of the long-term effects of media usage or the long-term effects of these interventions, um, which again relates to our next point that many uh, media literacy interventions focus on attitudes or interpretations of things instead of actual behavioral changes. So, you know, we're looking at whether or not this advert game or, you know, this type of media content, how children feel about it in the short term, but we're not actually looking at you know, there's not a lot of research that looks at their actual behavioral changes based on their usage or based on these interventions. Um, and the final limitation is that, you know, some of these interventions can have boomerang effects, which means they're sort of generating interest in these products as opposed to creating a negative reaction to the content, which is the intended effect of the intervention. Mm. Okay, so if anyone is interested in designing their own intervention, um, from the research, these are sort of some guidelines and issues to consider. So first, establish your goals. So will you emphasize consumer empowerment? Um, are you sort of empowering your participants to you know, use and make use of the benefits of media? Or are you protecting them from potential dangers of media? Um, and I think we have discussed this, you and I, that we think it's good to kind of, when you're looking at designing your own intervention, to have a combination. Exactly, or just, you know, if you're focusing, the next one is establishing the problem, look at how to come at that from both sides. Like, is there a way to empower your participants while also, you know, developing their attitudes about the dangers of this type of media or, you know, shaping how they think about it and how they feel at the same time. Um, so again, establishing the problem, what is the focus of the intervention? And remember to be specific. Um, established location. So will this intervention occur in the classroom or will it occur at home uh, with the help of parents or is it a combination of both environments? I mean, ideally, we would say it's a combination of both but environments. But that's not always yeah. possible, yeah. <laughs> but it's something, you know, that's very important if you're, you know, emphasizing something in school, is there a way to bring this into the home to sort of reinforce it? Because obviously a lot of media usage occurs at home. Um, <clears throat> establish the developmental level. So is the intervention developmentally appropriate? So an intervention designed for preschoolers will obviously look very different than an intervention for freshmen in high school. So it's important to look at the different developmental theories related to media literacy, um, to understand how your audience will engage with the different types of media to ensure that um, the intervention will be effective and accessible to them. And establish the intended effects. So what are both the long-term and the short-term effects? Um, as we've said, you know, many interventions only deal with short-term effects, but is there a way to look at this longitudinally and see if there's any actual behavioral changes or if there's any long-term effects that, you know, may come about based on your intervention? And how will you measure these? Um, and it's also important to establish and consider the unintended effects. You know, do you anticipate any boomerang effects? So using games as an example, again, you know, you may generate interest in the advertised product because it's a fun game, you know, versus creating a negative attitude or a negative reaction to the content, which may be the intended effect. So that's just something to consider. Are there any possible alternative outcomes that could come from this intervention? So these are just general guidelines to consider when you're trying to create effective media literacy interventions. 
Um, and here we're presenting just some related resources. Um, we listed several websites that provide information on media usage and some suggested readings that deal with different types of interventions and with media literacy in general. Um, and we've also listed our contact information. So if there's any questions about this presentation, you know, afterwards, definitely please uh, feel free to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually concludes the presentation. So we'd like to open it up to any questions that we have. Well, thank you, Jessica and Lauren. Really uh, insightful presentation. It's great to hear the um, research that you've been doing on this. What I'd like to do is um, I think some people might be on mute, so you'll have to unmute yourself if you have a question for them. Mary, by any chance, do you have audio today? And do you have a question for them? You can type it in chat if you do. Um, and I'd like to open it up to others. What questions you might have for um, Jessica and Lauren? I have a question. This is Tanisha. Okay. Um, fabulous job, by the way. This is really, really cool. And a lot of great information. So thank you again for doing it. Thank you. Um, I had a question about, I wrote down so much stuff that you were talking about and just like great solid points. And one of them being like that digital presence through a filter, you know, like taking 50 takes of a selfie and getting it right, filtered right angle and all that stuff and how that can kind of translate into, you know, your own self-esteem, your own is like a measurement of self-worth and stuff. So I've been doing some research lately on a lot of different branding and I've noticed that some brands have now started to design campaigns almost like a media literacy intervention where they're starting to promote consumer empowerment and stuff like that. And one of them I did, uh, damn, might be a year ago now, um, was on Reebok and they kind of did this counter punch to body shaming and that selfie stance, you know, where you, that image or that idea that you said of like your presence through a filter and they thought that, or they believe that, you know, your perfect self isn't after 50 takes with the right filter and all that stuff. Your most perfect, beautiful self is after you put in some work, you've sweat and you've earned it. And so they have this campaign called Break Your Selfie. And they want right. you to use that hashtag and post the picture of you like after a hike or a workout or something like that. Just completely raw and unfiltered, just sweat with some hair messed up and all that stuff as a way to promote that consumer empowerment. And I thought that was awesome. And I'm wondering though, What's the best way to measure the efficacy of, of media literacy? Like, how is it measured? And I guess that kind of goes into a monitoring, like a long-term behavior, like you said, or if it's short-term. And I guess it would be dependent uh, per demographic, too. Like, it'd be different for every type of intervention, right? Yeah. So I, I'll speak to this first, and then you can speak, Lauren. Um, I think that that's sort of been a limitation of this field is that, you know, these types of campaigns, like we've also seen the Dove campaign for real women. And Under Armour had a good campaign with um, the ballerina at 82. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's sort of, you know, as a side note too, important to remember that these are still also advertising campaigns, so they are still trying sure. to manipulate you in one way or the other. But the, the, the issues that with, you know, measuring this is that often what's being measured, you know, for take this campaign, like what would be measured is sort of our gut reaction to it. And there's not a lot, I mean, there's consumer research that will see, you know, whether or not um, the company shares go up, they'll sort of monitor whether or not their marketing campaigns are working. But there's not research that's being done where, you know, you can measure someone's attitude towards the product or towards the message when it comes out and then follows up with them a month later or six months later to see, did they buy that product? You know, mm -hmm. did taking that selfie lead to them not using as many filters, you know, a couple months down the line, or did they only take that filter or take that selfie with that hashtag and then go back to the behaviors that they were already, um, you know, demonstrating. So I think that that's sort of an issue. And I think that that's something that's, very important to look at, you know, are you affecting people's behaviors? Are you making long term changes with these types of interventions with these types of messages? Or is it sort of 
Because the, you know. yeah, the brands are focused on whether or not their product is being bought. So they're not necessarily as focused on, did you change that person's life? Exactly. It's like, did you make them be kind of a brand ambassador for you? Mm -hmm. You know, are they now hooked into your brand because of this campaign? Mm -hmm. So they're not going to do the research on it because they just want to know whether or not their product their is product being sells. bought. Yeah. Um, so it would have to be kind of us, our duty as researchers on the other end to kind of really, you know, produce that research. So kind of taking a campaign that is coming across with more of a positive message. Mm -hmm. So Dove, Under Armour, or Reebok, um, and kind of seeing what positive changes, if at all, kind of happened through someone being kind of hooked into that message. So it's kind of, it's really, you know, our responsibility on, on this end to Exactly. And I will say, like, that's a great question. And I feel like that's a great jump off for an intervention. You know what I mean? Like taking things like that and using it to start a discussion or using it in a classroom and saying, okay, this is a campaign that's selling somebody, you know, break yourself. But, like, this is a campaign that's promoting this type of awareness, this type of body image. How can you create something that's similar? Mm -hmm. You know, how, and do you think that this will have a long-term impact? Um, going back to sort of our media literacy, how can you take action? Um, I just think that these things are very important, and I think that they're really interesting, but I think that the research in this area is not quite there yet. You know, we don't know the answers of the long-term effects of this. Yeah, I think you brought up a really good point about making that line distinction between like, okay, brands more monetizing, and then there's, you know, the research our side, and it kind of proves the point that, the two need to be merged, <laughs> you know, yeah. that they can, yeah, like exactly. big brands, like can hire, you know, media psychologists, media literacists, researchers to do that kind of stuff to see what works, what doesn't, and the long-term effects that it can have. Because when you are that brand ambassador and you wear that shield of, you know, UA or Reebok or something like that, then, you know, it really does trickle down from behavior to what's, what's actually spent out of your wallet. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. I actually think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you. Oh, that's great. Oh my gosh, I finally, I finally got this call. Technology is on my side today. Um, first of all, let me apologize for my typo in that uh, chat I sent you. But anyway, um, I'm very concerned. Um, I'm going to go just a little bit different in my question from what you all have been talking about and that is um with this new emphasis in schools on media literacy and on technology a number of different things are falling by the wayside for instance schools in my hometown are no longer teaching cursive writing and really don't even emphasize on printing for kids to be able to do that because there's such an emphasis on technology so it seems like as we become more media literate, we're all we're kind of going away from uh, literacy in other areas. What are your thoughts about that? So, I I, I see your point, um, but I feel like sort of what your point is that kids are being taught to type versus you know learning cursive. Um, that's only one element of media literacy, and I would sort of argue that you know, we can all agree that there's not enough time in the school day, obviously, to cover all these topics. But I, I don't agree that sort of they're pushing media literacy in school because it's sort of like teaching kids, giving them the tools to, you know, use a computer or type a paper or use Microsoft Office. But it's not going further into sort of bolstering their understanding of these media messages. Um, but, okay. You know, I would also argue that this is sort of the world that kids live in now. You know, I don't, I think that there's probably a place for both these things. And obviously, um, traditional literacy is extremely important. But I think that, you know, more and more kids will have to work within technology and have to sort of use these um, different types of media. And I think that it is important to sort of incorporate that into the curriculum. Um, because that's just the world that they live in at this point. You know, and I and I agree with Jess. I mean, I think there still needs to be kind of the emphasis on you know the tradition of you know writing, like printing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that's yeah. obviously an important skill that I I don't agree should be lost as well as cursing. But you know, I Jess and I have joked in the past where like. I got my first cell phone when I was like 19 years old. 
like nowadays that we're right. part of because of the advances that we've made in technology in the past 15 years. You have to teach these generations how to use technology, how to code, uh, how to really be technolo technologically literate to really advance us, you know, in a lot of fields. Yeah. That being said, just as, you know, being under understanding how to use technology versus understanding what the technology is telling us, yeah. then it, it's two different things. So whereas you know, there's more of the emphasis on typing and coding and things like that, we're not seeing it go that extra step yet. Whereas, okay, you're using this, but what is it kind of t giving you? What can you get from it? Yeah, how to critically read it, how to sort of yeah. evaluate these messages that you're seeing. Um, but you I know, every student in my home, in my hometown, every student is given a computer. They don't have to rely upon the families furnishing the computers. The schools furnish the computers. So there really is a very high technology um, emphasis. And what do you think about, I, I know there's a bit of a trend toward developing national standards of media literacy. What do you think about that? I mean, I, I think that that is sort of a goal to aim towards because that would sort of indicate that it's part of the curriculum, you know, um, schools will all be made to sort of incorporate it into their curriculum um, and sort of reach the standard. Uh, so I feel like that, you know, I think that I support that and I think that we're a long way off from that, you know, in that, as we've said, these, you know, media literacy education in school right now just tends to be one lesson at one point in time very briefly um so i and, think and normally yeah. it's not by someone who necessarily has the media literacy education to give the lesson exactly it's sometimes someone that it's you know maybe it's a chapter in a book or mm -hmm. you know maybe they you know are a psychology professor but only took one class about it so it's it not it's not necessarily someone who really is um you know, trained, I, yeah. trained in it, you know. Yeah, and I, I, I would almost argue that I think it could be very useful to have it um, as, you know, say you're in high school, you know, with you saw that example with Texas where it's sort of a, a project that they're made to do and they have to sort of pass this statewide project um, in terms of graduating. I think that that's a nice way to sort of incorporate into the curriculum in its own sort of bucket without, you know, pulling away from other subject areas where the teachers may not be trained to provide this type of education. Um, so I think that that might be a good way to incorporate into the curriculum. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think having a standard, we have standards across other types of the curriculum. So I think that that would be an interesting thing to revisit once it is actually part of the curriculum basis. Well, very interesting. Now, let me ask you another thing. I belong to my local Rotary Club, and one of the things that we do every year is we give every fourth grader in um, all of the schools in the area their own dictionary with their name in the front. So that, and I have to tell you, these little kids are just crazy about this yeah. because this is oftentimes the first thing that somebody outside of their family has given them that has their name in it. You know, like strangers are giving this to them. And I'm wondering if we should also consider now switching from a book to maybe a disc or something like that. Because, I mean, you know, the kids are really, they're electronic now. They don't really go to books. Exactly. Like, you know, they use Google. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, Mary, and Mary, I have to laugh because discs probably are outdated for them as well. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Oh my God, where am I? I'm, I'm a Neanderthal myself. So. Yeah, well, I know. It's like, it's like this evolving language, but that is a really good point. And I think as media psychologists, that's something that's really, uh, I've always been fascinated in and what is lost and what is gained as we, as we sort of move through these various new technologies and as, a, as we're addressing them. And, and you know, I've really come to believe, and I'd like to see the research to support this, that it's not good or bad, it's just different. And we are probably, you know, rewiring our neural pathways so that we're much more efficient. I, this, um, I just broke my right wrist. I'm right hand dominant. 
My whole, oh my, my whole life is depending on being on the computer. And I found something that I was fascinated with because I've learned to write pencil and paper. Um, so I'm still, my preference is tactile, even though I'm on the computer a lot. So I just assumed my composition was still the same way. And all of a sudden, when I couldn't type and I had to go play with, um, um, you know, the you know uh, dictation software and things like that, well, it was challenging because sometimes the dictation software wouldn't get it right. What was even more challenging was my composition. My actual thinking process had gotten to the point where I typed it out. And now all of a sudden, when I had to speak it out, it was a challenge. So again, I think what we need to look at is really, is it the tool and how is it really is it really um, an impediment or just a new way of doing it and that each each not even a full generation, but each group as as their whatever technology they learn on, maybe that's where they go the smoothest or the one that they use the most. So it's, it's fascinating. I agree with you that it's just I think it is different, but we also then need to make sure we have the appropriate, you know, coping skills and mechanisms to help, you know, these generations learn to interpret it the way that you know, we had the same, with the same research involving print media, you know, mm -hmm. when we were, you know, growing up, we, yeah, there was all this research in print media done. And so we kind of were able to kind of, you know, have that information. I think it's important. Uh, you know, I think it just is different. Like, again, my nephew is five and he's used to being on the iPad and scrolling through photos like this. And we gave him a printed photo book Mm -hmm. um, when he was maybe two mm -hmm. of, you know, people and he went like this to try to scroll through the photo book. He didn't realize to turn, you had to turn yeah. the page mm -hmm. and it's just because it was something different for him. Um, and I've seen that as well. So I've done research um, with iPad app testing with children as young as three and they know how to use it. You know, I don't have to go in and explain to them how to work an iPad. Um, so I think that the education should sort of it, you know, these children are using these devices, like they're using this anyway. So I think that they should be instructed, um, you know, how to, how to work within that, you know, how to either, exactly, how to either sort of protect themselves or how to be these, you know, educated media users to empower them. I can't wait to see the kind of neural um, psychology findings we're going to have because Jerry Lynn what you said about the neural pathways being changed I truly believe that there's something to that you know there is some research done with some Native American tribes who grew up in um, their whole environment was circular there were no right corners and so when they would take neurological tests they would they couldn't make right corners so they would be um, um, diagnosed with neurological deficits, but it had to do with their environment never teaching them those kinds of templates. So I'll be very interested to see what kinds of research comes out with the neuro stuff. One of my most favorite and eeriest cartoons shows a woman standing in profile who's pregnant, and she's standing over a desk, and on the desk is a an um, iPhone and coming out of her womb reaching is a hand <laughs> and it's kind of like we have no concepts of what um, you know what it's doing to us psychologically and also one of the reasons why I asked you about the cursive writing is that I think one of the implications that we have to think about is we have a finite universe and if we're going to insert something something's going to have to fall out and we have to figure out what it is that can fall out and when we talk about being so involved in um, technology there's something that we're going to be missing and I know a lot of us talk about the lack of social skills and lack of being able to just talk to another person that is disappearing and is there some way that we might be able to use technology to actually bring back the ability to open your mouth and to speak with another person so if we can if it's going you know 
maybe we won't lose it if we kind of use the new means to improve it or something. So I actually, that is like the one thing that I have something to say about too. Um, the, what you're just saying about communication um, and kind of being lost and maybe there are ways to bring it back um, using media. I actually disagree with that because I think that, um, uh, I think, well, I, first of all, I think that it, really, really depends on the individual. But I, I think that like um, different forms of media and part of why media literacy is so important is because there are different forms of media that actually um, help people be able to communicate better. And um, where like in person, you know, if there's like anxiety or something, um, in person they might have a hard time, you know, talking where Jerry Lynn was saying, you know, when she had to dictate, it was harder than her writing. There's some people that that's just the general rule. Um, and then now media, I think, facilitates different types of media facilitate different types of communication. And there is actually a lot of research in gaming that suggests that people who um, communicate and get used to communicating in games actually that translates into real life and they have a much easier time communicating um, in real life with people because of that. So wow. I think that it's one of the reasons that media literacy is wow. hugely important because it's not taking away from, um, it's just like there are different learning styles. I don't think that it's taking away from the styles, like the types of literacy that we already have. I think that it's giving us an additional tool for people who may not be adapted as well to the ones that we already have. You know, and there's a lot That's of interesting. There's a lot of research, and I'm not sure if it's the research you're, you're referencing, Lily, but there's a lot of research um, focusing on engagement in virtual social worlds, like Second Life, and the importance that's, that's played in a lot of people's lives in terms of feeling more confident in their offline worlds. Um, I think, though, to the earlier point that, so I agree, I think that there, I think media can really open up a lot of avenues of communication uh, mm -hmm. for people that either were ashamed of who they were and are able to go on the internet and really feel comfortable in that space and then feel comfortable in their offline worlds. I think there is an importance, though, on not being, because the generations behind and even, you know, some people older than that are doing all this media multitasking, I think there is an importance to shutting it off though at times and engaging person to person. Um, so I think that there's that piece of it um, as well. But I, I do agree that I think media can be used in really um, the new media technologies like the internet, like these virtual social worlds um, can be used for positive experiences yeah. Um, it's just a matter of being able to shut it off and enjoying your offline world as well. Uh, I think there's that balance that needs to happen. Yeah, very interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to echo um, Melody's comments too because I've seen that type of research where it's very dependent on that person and knowing what your goal is using the media going into it, you can find an unexpected outcome of, okay, now I'm more confident. I'm a bit more strengthened now. And that definitely translates, you know, out into the physical real world. And you've seen, there's been some pictures of floating around online and I've seen it here in person here in LA where coffee shops will, you know, on the chalkboard be like, no Wi-Fi, talk to the person next to you. Or they, don't <laughs> want you to, they don't want you to be on your computer and all that stuff. And, you know, I typically don't go there because I need my computer and I'll pop up and talk to somebody when I need to. So it's kind of like, all right, I'm a person in that situation. But I've also noticed that new media technology can kind of, or at least with myself personally, there might be something to back it up, that it's allowed me to find a new value system and kind of find out, okay, like what's kind of important to me. Because I've noticed on a few occasions where, um, it's been integrated and it kind of goes back into what Mary was talking about, about the cursive. There was, um, it was actually Reebok. Um, I was communicating with him online over Twitter, um, some back and forth and they sent me a DM and they're like, Oh, send us your address. I'm like, yeah, okay. So I give them my address anyway. And then they sent me a care package and yeah. on that care package though, it was handwritten in cursive. And it like, and with their signature, it was, you know, like at Reebok. And I was like, wait a minute, I got a handwritten note? I can't remember the last time I had a handwritten note. You know, it's always an email. 
for a voice mail, but it meant so much to me that it was handwritten. That little, it's the little things like that. I was like, oh my God. So it's like, yeah, I'm team Reebok for life now because they took the time to handwrite a note, but it was all facilitated online in new media. Well, you know, we should have we should have a new etiquette book come out. You know, like the Emily Post etiquette or something like that. Because I've had more conversations about whether thank you notes are acceptable if you send them via email right. versus you know writing them and sending them through the mail. And a number of older people, but I'm also seeing some younger people too who are also saying only the handwritten notes really make a difference. Yeah, it's those kind of little things. And going back, I guess, into children um, in, in the classroom, I have several friends that, you know, are applauding the amount of coding and computerized education that's going into their school system now because it's going to set them up for a job now. Because if we look at the trends now, I mean, kids being able to learn HTML and coding and all of that stuff, they it's almost like, all right, well, they're going to be set up for a job now in one of these different fields, just like there was auto body. I don't even know if that still exists. Now I think about it. Um, like home Mac and auto body and all these things, but learning, integrating coding and things like that in HTML, it's going to be able to set them up for a job because that's the transition and that's the direction that, you know, every industry is going into now. So they're, you know, most parents that I know um, that have kids in K through 12, they're applauding it like good. Now I'm going to pose another question for you all, and I hope that it's going to absolutely blow your minds. <laughs> and that is, there's a really good video by um, a Kansas State University professor named Michael Wesch, W-E-S-C-H, and you can get it online. And I can't remember what the first part of it is, but it's something about uh, like the web is using us. You, uh, the web is us, or us using us, or something like that. But anyway, Michael, part of what he talks about is that we have to prepare students today for jobs that we can't even comprehend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You I know, know, when I was, uh, and I'm not even going to tell you how long ago I was a, a graduate student, we did not, I mean, we had to use cards and, you know, it took forever to input stuff and and it truly was amazing. And actually when I was at Harvard University, I saw the first computer. And I was there the same time Bill Gates was there and you don't even remember Wang. You guys have never heard of Wang probably. But Wang was really, he was the for, for, uh, in the forefront at that point and nobody even heard of Gates. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that as much as we think we're in the forefront by bringing technology in, we shouldn't lose the basic knowledge that what we have to do is teach students how to learn. Mm -hmm. Because who knows what kind of technology or lack of technology is going to be in the future. And if we become um, knowledge bound to the tools that we use, then we are going to be <clears throat> doing our students a disservice. Mm -hmm. So I've actually, I've, you know, I've heard that as well, that, you know, I don't remember the percentage of it, but um, a number of jobs that students now will get have not even been created or thought of yet. Um, and I, I think that, I agree that they need to, you know, learn to learn across various platforms, but I think that media literacy can tie into that because there's so many different platforms and they're constantly evolving. Um, and there's also sort of a point to be made um, to incorporate creativity into the curriculum and, create, you know, be able to use different types of platforms um, to be creative and to problem solve and just to be able to be flexible critical and critical thinker. Exactly. So I think that um, this sort of type of development um, is beneficial to students now as it's sort of evolving their thinking across these multiple platforms um, in a way that potentially may make them more flexible learners and be able to exactly it helps mm -hmm. them learn to learn you know what i mean gives them right the, gives right. them those core tools about okay this is there's a platform out there that we haven't even imagined that you know mm -hmm. my son who's eight months old is going to be engaging with when he's 15. Yeah. so it's mm -hmm. like how can we teach you know 
younger generations how to you know learn it's again these core tools of the critical thinking the flexibility the creativity learning to learn so that whenever they're faced with what's next they'll be able to adapt to it and you know be able exactly. to engage with it in the appropriate way and i don't i don't necessarily think that that comes to a head with media literacy i think that that can actually work well with media yeah. literacy. exactly exactly i think yeah. there there are some there are like well um so i i have done um a lot of uh research in media literacy too um for various things um, and one of the things that I think is interesting about that comment is that there are actually definitions of media literacy out there um, because there are so many different like aspects of media literacy and not all of them are necessarily really specifically talking about the same thing. But like one of the definitions of media literacy specifically talks about the, the ability to produce and navigate media, whatever they are, like just in general, um, to be able to like take a new piece of media and figure out how to use it, how to get a message across, how to interpret the messages in general. So like that is, that's exactly what, at least um, I can think of the one specific definition of media literacy that is that exactly what you guys are talking about, like that exact thing. I really want to thank um, both Jessica and Lauren and, and then also Fran because she certainly is, is here in spirit and certainly woven through the text um, all of today. Uh, all three of you for an excellent presentation and, and the opportunity for us to explore media literacy a lot deeper and to hear about your research. And, and just like uh, Mary had stated, we, we look forward to seeing future iterations of this in, in a whole variety of ways. And we just want to thank you very much um, for well, thank being Thank you guys so much for having us. I yeah. had a great presentation. So thank, thank you. you all very much. And Sherry thank Lynn, you guys. And thanks, thanks for, for this well, series. Well, Keep going. Plotting for thank you. you. <laughs> be in touch. Thank you, everyone. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.